Hello, welcome back, everyone, to the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I'm Jesse Collings, joined as always with my co-host, Jason Unpresser. Jason, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing well. Um, obviously, um, you know, by the title of um this uh, episode, we are looking at uh, a big, big summer to head for pro wrestling. But unfortunately for uh, for WWE fans, it looks like uh, their Lord and Savior, Roman Reigns, uh, might not be there for, for at least half of their big shows, uh, presumably. Yeah, I mean, this is a really, I think this is going to be an incredibly exciting time for wrestling fans over the next few months. We have just a slew of major shows happening during the summertime. Um, And, you know, it wasn't that long ago where the summer was like a dead time for wrestling. You had basically a SummerSlam as the only major WWE event that would happen. And SummerSlam always would happen like at the very end of summer, at least to me, and at least when I was a kid, because summer would always be defined by when school vacation ended. And SummerSlam happening in late August was always like right before school started. So it was always kind of like a melancholy goodbye to the summer, but that was pretty much it. And then over the years, you know, for a variety of different reasons, the summer has become more and more important um, to, to me as a wrestling fan. And I think to a lot of people, uh, you know, Money in the Bank kind of emerging as a really significant WWE pay-per-view and not just a, a B-show pay-per-view that they had um, is, you know, obviously helped from a WWE perspective because now you got kind of two big shows that are taking place during the summer. You throw in AEW, obviously, Double or Nothing, which is kind of at the start of the summer, you know, obviously one of their biggest events, and then All Out at the end of the summer, kind of bookending um, the two things together. And then you have um, a bunch of other kind of other events that have kind of popped up the G1 in the summer, which obviously has always been happening in the summer, although it's returning to the summer for the first time in a couple of years this year. Um, but, you know, obviously as of getting into New Japan Pro Wrestling, that made the summer a lot different. Uh, you got Best of Super Juniors, which is starting up very, very shortly. Um, and just, it's, it, it's just a better time to be a wrestling fan now with, it seems like there's going to be a major event, you know, basically once every two weeks from here through Labor Day. Um, well, I guess we'll start, Jason. Is there, what event out of everything that's happening this summer, out of all the ones that I mentioned, um, do you have the most uh, excitement about? Yeah, I would say, um, at least quickly going on to your, your first point, I mean, like, it's kind of interesting from a business perspective, how pro wrestling companies, um, you know, they, they haven't really uh, capitalized on the whole, the summer angle um, for the most part, because usually, at least in the U.S., you know, for summertime, it's usually just baseball going on in terms of the major sports, like um, football is in its offseason, you got preseason uh, by the time SummerSlam goes on. So you would think, like, especially the way WWE, you know, Raw always gets uh, hammered from Monday Night Football, like they would capitalize on that. Looks like they are doing that now uh, as of late. Uh, but yeah, for I mean, I think it's got to be the Forbidden Door, right? On June 26th, you got the United Center. Obviously, um, with the ticket sales, um, they sold out pretty quickly. Um, they are op- they are opening up um, more um, seats, I think, from WrestleTix's um, uh, counts. I think uh, as many as 18,000 um, total um, but in terms of the opened up seats um, that they've opened up uh, for Forbidden Door. And so obviously from a ticket sales perspective, I don't think there was, um, I guess there's some doubt from others in the uh, wrestling media landscape that it could, uh, it might not be uh, successful, but like, obviously like the hype for the show is going to be huge. Obviously, um, AEW right now, fo- or they're focusing on um, double or nothing um, in that build uh, there. And so we're not really sure what the card will look like, at least, you know, it could easily just be um, similar to what we got earlier in the year of New Japan, Noah, mostly just a bunch of tag matches. But of course, you know, it's a different perspective where like, you know, the tag matches will probably be a lot more exciting uh, with AEW's talent uh, mixing around with the New Japan talents in terms of star power, at least. But obviously, you know, best of the Super Juniors coming around at the, around the same time. There's a lot more leeway to have the heavyweights come in a lot more in AEW um, television to help build uh, the card. And so it's mostly a way and see in terms of what the card will look like. But the hype for the show is um, just, you know, huge. 
Yeah, that's a good point about Best of Super Juniors kind of being the tour at the moment for New Japan Pro Wrestling, which would allow you to do things like have your top stars, whether it's Okada or Tanahashi or Shingo Takagi or these people that normally would be counted on to kind of headline houses in, in Japan, they can have that time off to come to America and do um, some AEW tapings. I would be I wouldn't be surprised if we were to see that happen. The thing about Forbidden Door, and while I'm kind of hesitant to say like it's my number one, this is what I'm the most excited for, um, is for what the reasons you said is that it's just a mystery box at this point. We don't know what that show is going to look like. We can fantasy book all of the things that we want. Um, I mean, if it's just tag matches, look, I'm sure they'll be great, but that's not the ceiling for this show. The ceiling is all these great singles matches between AEW wrestlers and New Japan Pro Wrestling wrestlers. It just, I can't, but I can't say like, I'm excited for it because, you know, I, I, I'm a really big fan of both promotions and I'm excited to see them working together. But I just, there's nothing on the card at the moment at all. So it's hard for me to really be like, yes, Forbidden Door is going to be this amazing, amazing, incredible wrestling show. It just, it's, and for some people, the allure of we don't know what's going to happen yet and the anticipation of it is more exciting than if we had a solid card. I get, I, I get that impression kind of um, as well, but that's something that I think is going to be uh, a key component of how excited I think I'm going to be personally be for Forbidden Door. Yeah, for sure. I mean, 100%. I, I totally agree. I mean, is there a show that you're looking forward to um, in terms of the big uh, summer shows? You know, I, it's hard to say at the moment. I'm, I can't really pick. I can't honestly pick one. I think um, Double or Nothing, because we have at least a card. We have the CM Punk versus Hangman Adam Page yep. match as the main event. We also have Thunder Rosa versus Serena Deeb. As the woman for the women's title, we'll have the Owen Cup tournament finals for both the men and the women. There's also a, the Hook Danhausen versus Tony Nice in Smart Mark Sterling on uh, the pre show. So we have like at least the major matches for that card. I mean, I'm really excited about that. I mean, I'm, I'm more, I'm obviously more excited for AEW than I am for WWE. Uh, just as a general product rule. So uh, there's a bunch of AEW shows that I'm really looking forward to this year. Um, but I, at the moment, I have to say Double or Nothing just because it's the closest and because I have the idea for it. But, um, you know, I'm really excited for Double or Nothing. I'm really excited for Forbidden Door. I'm really excited for this AEW debut in Los Angeles at, at, in, in Inglewood um, because that's obviously going to be presented, I think, as a major, major show for AEW. Um, we got Grand Slam, which Tony Khan announced is coming back, but we don't have a date for that yet. But I assume that might maybe that will be a September date, but that that's also coming. I mean, those are the the, the and then you got All Out, which I want to talk about All Out a little bit later uh, in the pod. But all of that stuff looks tremendous. Um, but yeah, I think I think if I were to pick one right now, I'd just say Double or Nothing because I, I really enjoyed the the Hangman Page and CM Punk. Um, story so far in the last two weeks where basically both guys are leaning into being people are like oh they're being a heel and, and I guess Punk with the 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 you know the John Tavares jersey on Wednesday night was definitely trying to get a reaction from the live crowd that was negative um, but I don't think like people are like oh Hangman Page he's he's turning heel or he's working heel for this feud and I thought that was very simplistic analysis of it because I just assumed you know he's got to have an edge to this thing he can't just be a happy baby face i want i think everyone wants their their hero to be kind of a dick sometimes and that's definitely cm punk's calling card is that he's kind of a dick sometimes and i think both guys kind of leaning into that aspect of it and kind of you know having this bend to their attitude makes the match much more fascinating and i really don't know who's going to win which you know normally you know fans that at you and i you know my level and your level which you know that sounds kind of like uh, arrogant, but we usually <laughs> know who's going to win these matches. And, and right. I will say that I am, I'm very unsure about who the CM Punk and then a page winner is going to be. Um, and it's that kind of anticipation that makes big matches feel really big. And it makes world championships look really important because we really don't know who's going to win, but we know what does happen is going to feel like a big deal. Yeah. I think, you know, for Heyman page, I think he's doing a good job at playing that at, uh, on that line where he is, 
playing more as an edgier baby face, but also he can play um, a heel. He is on the edge of being a heel as well, because obviously, you know, CM Punk is very popular. And so, um, you know, I think this is something that um, has been talked about how like Tony Khan is that of that old school ilk, ilk where he, you know, is that tra- wants that traditional baby face versus heel uh, t- type of uh, bouts for these big matches, obviously he isn't, you know, strict into that, uh, philosophy he'll play you know um, pretty loose with that uh, depending on the story and you know I think this is the kind of case where you can do that if you want but also you know everyone loves Hangman Page as well and so you know he is just having more of an edge to him and not just the stereotypical you know dumb baby face that we've seen in WWE and so I think he's doing a good job of playing that line there of those two um, sort of types of characters. Hangman to me is like the perfect baby face. Yeah. Like, I think his championship run, remember when he first won the title and there was this belief that it was like, he needs to be the, 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 he needs to, he needs to have a shorter reign, right? I, he, I'm right. going to like him better as a, as a guy chasing the title than a guy as champion if it's his character more, um, you know, and people were like, oh, he's going to be the first kind of AEW champion to have like a short reign, which you need to have to kind of freshen things up. It's not very dramatic if everyone that gets the title holds it for a year, right? but I think he's totally changed. I think a lot of people's perceptions about him as a, as a top guy um, that he can be the champion for a long period of time. I think he's, he's the best baby face world champion. Uh, I can recall in a very long time because he's so just the way he presents himself and the way AEW books him, I just think is so well done where he is popular he is tough. He doesn't back down from fights. He doesn't let um, guys, you know, kind of get the better of him. He's not stupid, which is such a big problem historically with wrestling baby faces that the baby face is an idiot and like will run into trouble and get beat up by 20 heels because they don't have any friends or all of these kind of things. He outsmarts the, the heels. He rarely, he, he sells, but he's protected when he does so. I just think he's like the perfect babyface champion. I know a lot of people liked Moxley um, in his championship run, but to me, that wasn't necessarily, that was more of a, like a, that wasn't a, a traditional babyface champion. Moxley was kind of like, the difference between Moxley and Paige is that Moxley got his ass kicked all the time. And it was because he was just, he didn't like, it wasn't that he was necessarily dumb, but he just didn't care if he got beat up as long as he could get his hands on people. And he was this loose cannon guy. That was this anti-hero kind of personality. And to me, Paige is, is more traditional in that. Like, he's smart. He's not going to run into trouble. He has friends that help him. Like, all of these things that, uh, you know, maybe they, they're the kind of classic anti-hero doesn't have. I just think he's just such a great babyface performer. And I'm even more impressed by his work with the punk feud, which is like, yeah, I'm going to throw down, you know, I'm going to put on the black cowboy hat for a second. And I'm going to be a kind of a heel at this point. And I think you've seen, like, I saw some, I didn't make this point originally, but someone told me it when I was kind of talking about it, but like Hiroshi Tanahashi, who is probably the best baby face in, uh, when I said great baby face champions, I guess I forgot about Tanahashi and Okada, but Tanahashi, right, when he would wrestle another, especially if he was wrestling another baby face, especially when he was wrestling Okada, he would kind of be a dick about it. And he'd yep. be like, this guy's not on my level and I'm going to beat his ass, which is basically what Paige said to CM Punk. And to me, that's like model babyface work, which is like, yeah, I want my babyface to be really confident and think he's going to win every match just because he's wrestling another wrestler that the crowd and the fans like, um, or I might like personally, I still want my guy to feel really confident at the same way he would be confident if he was wrestling a heel. And I think that has really uh, elevated him to a new level. And it's kind of, I think that match with Punk is, is, is a massive, massive match. One of the biggest matches AEW's ever produced. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, I think by the time of, of Double or Nothing, just kind of looking, looking this up right now, like he'll already have passed uh, Chris Jericho's first title reign, which is um, the short, which is the shortest title reign anyone's ever had uh, at 182 days. Um, Paige has already held the title for over 180 days, so he'll already pass that. So at least he won't have the shortest title reign if he does lose to Punk, which is obviously a, a very realistic scenario because obviously Punk is a huge name and he is potentially a big money getter uh, for AEW. And so like there would be no like wrong decision there, but obviously like, I would prefer Paige to win that match just because like I feel like you want to have someone at least closer to his age to win the title. Um, 
at least you know uh, uh, somewhat worthy of um, beating Page uh, to really carry on um, that title, especially with the way the TNT title has been booked. Um, you know, you kind of need like a, a more of a, a stronger champion, um, at least uh, in my view. Yeah, I think his, his title run has, has flown by, like you said, it's already 180 days, basically. Um, you know, and, and double or nothing, and just talking about the card in a full, obviously we have only a few matches official, but we also kind of know the direction that we're going in for for a lot of these. You know, we're going to get something, I think, with the, the Jericho Appreciation Society and Eddie Kingston, probably a multi-man tag. The, the um, Blackpool Combat Club might be involved. It might be like a, a 10-man tag or something like that. Um, we have something, pro, you know, we have the, the, the Owen and the two Owen tournaments. We can kind of guess about what some of those matches might be. We won't know for sure. Um, but obviously I think both whatever, and both of both, whatever the finals are, I think are going to be intriguing matches, just given the talent that is available on, in both the men's and the women's bracket, you know, especially the men's side. I mean, we're talking about something like, Samoa Joe versus Adam Cole, or we'll see who the Joker candidate is. Um, but we're looking at, you know, a pretty, a pretty major match on that side. Um, and so, yeah, so, so that's, that's double or nothing. I mean, the, I'm really, it's not a singular match, but I am really interested in this best of the super juniors and I'm sure I'll be interested in the G1 too. I, I'll have to see the lineup, but I am more excited for this best of super juniors tournament than I have been about new Japan pro wrestling in a very long time. And the reason is because they've really gone out and got brought in a bunch of outsiders to create a bunch of fresh and interesting matchups, um, in this tournament. I, I've, 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 I like the G1. I like the best of super juniors, but the last few years being stuck with kind of only new Japan talent has made it less interesting because it's a lot of the same matches that we see all the time. Um, and but I, when I when we got the when we got the lineups last week for for the best of super junior blocks, I was like, oh man, this is incredible. This is going to be so it's going to be so interesting um, to watch some of these guys. I'm 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 going to watch a ton of it. I already know. Like I'm just going to be really fascinated to see pretty much every single match in this tournament because it's such an interesting mix of talent. Yeah, I think um, you know the feelings for best of the super juniors are just back to where they were. Um, pre-pandemic where they were allowed to bring in um, I, um, you know sort of newer talents or you know just talent from other uh, promotions and such and I do appreciate how uh, Teton is the one that's carrying the CMML CMLL uh, partnership on his shoulders because that's like the only wrestler uh, that they have and he's usually the guy uh, well, they usually have one other person but obviously like um, those other people have left uh, CMLL uh, since then and so he seems to be the only one carrying that partnership with New Japan on his shoulders yeah, there might have been, uh, you know, I, I forget off the top of my head, but I think another CML guy was supposed to be in there. It might have been Volador Jr. And something that they, he couldn't be on it. So he was replaced um, right. by somebody. And I can't, I don't know who the person who replaced him is. Uh, it might be TJP, but yeah, I mean, just I'll go through the blocks really quick. So for like the, the in the A block, we've got, uh, Rusuke Taguchi, Yo, Hiromu Takahashi, Yoshinobu Kanemaru, um, Taichi Ishimori, and Sho. Those are like the, so that's just, and that's in the A block. Those are like the New Japan guys in the A block. Okay. The non-New Japan guys or non-regular New Japan guys that we have in the A block, mixing it up with those guys are, you know, Clark Connors, who is coming from New Japan Strong, who we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Jason, like what these new Japan strong guys can do once they finally get to Japan. And that this is something that's been really over um, due for someone like Clark Connors, who's been training for years that we see him in Japan wrestling serious matches against, you know, other top juniors. That's something that I think I'm really excited for. What about you? Oh yeah. Well, I'm definitely excited for Clark Connors. I'm, I'm kind of curious on your perspective on this. Like uh, the, the, the three uh, the, the main new, new japan strong like daily dojo guys they're all pretty much like roughly of equal height and weight and so it's kind of interesting only clark connors is in this um i guess i, I don't know like do you have any like sort of strong takes like whether like, alex coglin or carl frederick should be heavies or juniors i, I mean i th i think there's a 
there's New Japan, especially in recent years, and especially during the pandemic when they were short on talent, have gone yeah. way more relaxed about like, oh, heavyweights and, and junior heavyweights and which one is which. And and obviously, like, you know, you're right, Connors, Coughlin, and Fredericks, and you could throw in like Kevin Knight and some of the other guys. Like, yeah. right, they're all like kind of the same size and they could probably pass for juniors or heavyweights depending on who you wanted to ask. But, you know, are those guys any bigger than than Tetsuya Naito or any any smaller than Naito or yeah. you know some of these other guys that are that are uh in the division I mean unless they're really really small um it doesn't really make that big of a difference to me if they can be juniors or heavyweights I feel like they maybe I think they clearly see Fredericks as a heavyweight um and this maybe looks like Connors is going to at least start as a junior um but he's obviously I think those are guys that are uh I don't really think that they're, I don't think it really means that much that they're, they're getting here. I mean, it, it's benefiting Clark Connors at the moment that he's being oh, yeah. considered a junior. Cause he's on this, he's in this, this tour. I don't mm-hmm. think um, Fredericks maybe, but I don't think Coughlin's working the G1. Like, so um, I don't see that. Uh, also joining, we have, you know, Ace Austin from impact wrestling. I actually haven't seen a ton of Ace Austin, but I, I, from what I've seen, he's a very good wrestler and will be just another guy who will be like, someone that maybe wasn't on the radar screen for a lot of people. And then he might have an excellent, you know, best of the super juniors. And then and people are going to be talking about him a lot more than they do at the moment. We also see Alex Zane who um, has worked in Japan strong. He's, you know, was in WWE for, for a, a hot minute. Another really athletic guy does a lot of flips, does a lot of cool stuff. I'm sure he's going to be, you know, those are the guys like Alex Zane's, you know, all these guys making their debuts, but especially guys like Alex Zanes, those guys are going to go so hard in this tournament, which is another thing that makes it kind of exciting because those are the guys that are just going to, they know they really, they're so amped up to do it. They know they want to have a great tournament and they're going to be going, you know, all out to try to, to try to get noticed and to show everyone that like I'm a major league talent and I deserve to work here more frequently. Um, we also got, you know, he, the, the last guy in the A block is, you know, Francisco Akira. Um, I don't know. Is he going by a different name now? He's listed as Francisco Akira. It, it um, could just be a, 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 a Akira, if anything. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm kind of getting this wrong. I should have figured this out, but I, I kind of remember he's maybe going by it. Well, he was going by um, Bru, Brucare, Bruciare, which is like burn in Italian. I thought that might be his name, but I think he might just be going by his old name, Francisco Akira. Um, but he's an interesting one because he joined, you know, he's with New Japan now. So he's not like an outsider that they're bringing in, but he hasn't wrestled, you know, any single, I don't think if he's wrestled at all in New yeah. Japan at the moment. And, you know, he's brought in as, as another guy for um, the Empire, Will Ospreay's group. Um, Akira came up through, he's, he's Italian, and I believe he started his career in Italy training. And then he went on to the All Japan Pro Wrestling Dojo and spent years working in All Japan and you know, won their all Japan, won their junior heavyweight championship, um, lost it, and then went back to Europe for a year. And now he's back in Japan with New Japan. And he's, you know, he's really young, even though I just described a kind of lengthy career. He's only 22. Um, He's someone with a lot of potential. And as another one that I'm really excited to see, you know, we're going to find out. I, I don't know if he's, I'm not confident, super confident that he is like going to be a top guy in New Japan's junior division. I don't know if he's that quality at this point in his career. Obviously he has plenty of room for improvement given he's only 22, but we're going to find out because he's going to be working all these matches and he's going to be working with all the top guys. So we're going to see him, you know, against, you know, Sho and Yo and Taichi Ishimori and Hiromu and, you know, the guys that are kind of put at the the top of that division. So um, he's someone I'm definitely really excited to see what he can bring to New Japan. Any other any comments on any of those other outsiders? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, Ace Austin's in this um, as of right now. Um, I don't know if like if there's been any tapings yet for uh, Impact, but he's the current X Division champion for Impact Wrestling, so it's kind of interesting to uh, have him there. Um, I'm kind of like you, Jesse. I haven't really seen a lot of him in Impact. Ironically, I've only seen him a lot more uh, when he makes these local appearances, whether it's for Beyond or uh, I think he's been a, cha- a chaotic. Um, uh, here as well, uh, locally in the Lowell Tewksbury area. And so I've, I've ironically seen him more there than actual uh, television, which he appears on. Um, but yeah, he's definitely a very exciting talent. He's also super young. 
Um, I think he's you know, just only a couple of years older than it, than uh, Francisco Akira. Um, and then, yeah, obviously, uh, Hiromu um, being the top guy in the junior division, um, obviously, I'm very curious to see, um, you know, what, what his direction is going to be. Obviously, everyone um, wants him to, you know, move up to heavyweights, but, you know, will this be his last best of the super juniors, perhaps, uh, if that is the case? And so, obviously, Taiji Ishimori is always uh, f- f- fun to watch and, you know, very exciting matchups all around, especially for, you um, yeah, like you said, the newer guys, like especially for like a guy like Alex Zane, who was really building up a lot of momentum, a uh, new Japan strong and really uh, becoming an exciting talent before WWE came in and signed him and then ended up not barely using him at all. And so obviously, uh, I'm sure he's uh, very motivated to show what he can do um, in front of a more larger audience. I know he does a lot of GCW shows, but um, I've honestly never really watched many of them. And so I'm very excited to watch more of Alex Zane again. Yeah, and so real quick with the B block, um, you got your normal, your New Japan regulars. We got Master Wato, Robbie Eagles, Bushi, El Desperado, Doki, uh, and El Fantasmo. And then for your outsiders, we got Titan from uh, CMLL. We've got uh, El Lindemann uh, from Strong Hearts, you know, freelancing group. Shima is a group that we've seen him a little bit in New Japan here and there. Um, this year, and obviously this is a big opportunity for him in, in, in the best of Super Juniors. We also got Wheeler Utah from AEW. He is AEW's lone representative in this tournament. And then TJP, um, who's you know New Japan, New, ba- New Japan strong for a long time, has wrestled in New Japan before. Um, I think everyone knows what TJP brings to the table as a, as a performer. Um, maybe not as quite as, as many exciting new guys. A lot of these guys we've at least seen a little bit in, in, in New Japan. We've seen, T, uh, you know, Titan a number of times, uh, TJP, obviously. But obviously, Wheeler, Utah, as AEW's representative, this is the guy that I think, you know, is going to be really interesting to see how far he goes in the tournament. AEW has really started pushing him. And I think the idea is that, you know, they're taking him off TV for a few weeks when he's at by far the most momentum throughout his career. And so they're risking doing that. Um, I don't know, risk, you know, like, like he, he has to be doing something really important in Japan to, to justify, I think, taking him off TV at the moment. And I think that he has to be someone that has to be relatively protected. Everyone else we've mentioned, all these other newcomers, the only one that I feel like as confident is going to be protected is, is, is Akira, because I feel like they're, actually pushing him because he's part of the uh um the empire which is a, you know a group that they're really trying to push really hard and build up but every one of the all the other like guys like ace austin and alex Zane, you know even clark connors or, or, or you know titan those guys i think can lose a lot wheeler utah is the guy that's got to be protected yeah i would not be surprised if wheeler utah is like at at the very least you know at least one of the like the b block final um yeah, you know, I don't know if he's actually, you know, going to make it that far in the tournament, but at least, you know, contending for the B block, B block final. Um, I can definitely see that because you're right. Um, you know, obviously they're very much pushing this, um, uh, this new faction he's in with, um, you know, Regal, Moxley, and Danielson. Um, but I guess, you know, they're already setting him on excursion. You know, it's only been a couple months and they're already sending him off uh, to get more training uh, elsewhere, um, I guess is what they can, they can probably say. Um, but yeah, you know, for Wheeler, Utah, it's, very exciting to see more of him uh, he's done a lot of great character work um mostly on like the indies the, from you know, again the local, local new england area plays a really good heel uh, around there but obviously in AEW television he's done a lot of good matches uh showing a lot of good technical work and obviously el desperado finally gets his match with el lindman and so that should be fun to watch as well uh, i think um i think that one of the press conferences uh desperado is already getting head to head with uh doki i think i saw and so, you know, Desperado is, uh, has got a chip in his shoulder, to say the least. And so that should be fun to watch, because I always, I always love watching El, El Desperado matches. Yes, we have El Desperado, El Lindemann, and El Fantasma all in this block. And yeah. uh, <laughs> none of them are actually, uh, you know, Latin American or, sp- or Spanish. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, no, Lindemann's a really great wrestler. I don't know oh, how yeah. much, a lot, I think a lot of people haven't seen that much of him, but like, he's a guy that can, is totally capable of just totally killing it in this tournament. Um, you know, B block is the same thing as A block, even though, you know, guys that we've seen a lot in New Japan, guys like Robbie Eagles and Fantasmo and Desperado. I mean, those guys are really good wrestlers. So they're going to have really good matches with, with maybe Wheeler Utah's and the the Linda bins of the world would it, so Wheeler Utah's 
um, New Japan or AEW's lone kind of representative in here. If you were looking at, if you're like Tony Khan, you're like, okay, we can send one guy to 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 New Japan to be in the best of Super Juniors. Would he have been the one you picked? Honestly, no. I would have thought like Lee Johnson would have been um, that representative for AEW. Um, I don't know. I just feel like you know he he, he fits more of that. Um, I, I think just more because he's not really doing much uh, compared to Wheeler Utah. Uh, I, th- I think that's more of the case. I would have just assumed like, oh, you know, we don't have a big storyline for you. You're not really, um, you know, in a growing faction. Um, I, I think, you know, Lee Johnson probably would have been my pick um, instead of Wheeler Utah. But, it's, you know, a, a happy surprise. Yeah, I know. It's interesting because well, for one thing, you got to take the person who's in this spot is going to be off of uh, – Television. Double or nothing. They're going to yeah, have double. television, but they're also going to miss double or nothing. So yep. someone like Jungle Boy, obviously he's tag team champion, not going to be, you know, you want to have him for double or nothing. He's almost too important. I think similar guys like Sammy Guevara and Darby Allen. Yep. Um, and those are also guys who are pushed really strong to a level that you might be more concerned about them losing, you know, in, in New Japan and, and being in best of super juniors, kind of being positioned as like a mid carter, like all junior heavyweights kind of always are in New Japan. You kind of, maybe don't want those guys being, you know, associated with that. Like if you're bringing, if you're sending a Darby Allen over there, you want them to be wrestling, like, you know, if not like Okada and Shingo, like someone like Haruki Goto or Minoru Suzuki or someone at kind of like that upper mid card level, not necessarily, you know, wrestling master Wato and, you know, Yoshi no, uh, Nobu Kanemaru. Um, yeah. I don't know about Wheeler. Like I, I would have been like, I really like Wheeler, Utah. I think like Dante Martin would be really cool to see in this tournament. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Lee Johnson, Lee Moriarty as well. Um, another guy who I think like, again, like kind of not doing anything in, in, mm-hmm. in, in AEW at the time. So like someone that you could kind of get away, you know, ship them off and they could lose and it wouldn't really be that big of a back deal to the, to them. If they lost because they're not really being pushed at the moment. Um, but yeah, definitely something to keep an eye on. I, like I said, it's going to be running from May 15th to June 3rd um should be a lot of fun i'm really excited about that um let's move on to kind of talk about some of wwe wwe has a monster summer on their end we have three stadium shows jason for wwe we have money in the bank which is going to be in las vegas we have um SummerSlam. SummerSlam, which is going to be in nashville um in august and then we have the um, clash at the castle right yep. that's what's called clash at the castle uh, at the old millennium stadium in cardiff wales which is probably going to do the largest crowd um wwe is going to do all year and probably the largest crowd they will have in a very long time i don't know what they will end up setting up for but it's going to be a massive show um at least attendance wise in the uk so they have a really big summer lined up um, as far as just major shows, I think it's kind of, it's going to be really interesting to see, uh, you know, how well those shows draw, uh, you know, the Cardiff show obviously is going to draw really well by all reports. They have a bunch of people like signed up to buy tickets already. The, I think that the tickets go on sale next week. People are expecting them to sell 80,000 tickets really quickly. Um, SummerSlam and Money in the Bank, those look like they're going to be like half filled stadium shows, which are big crowds, but not you know, 50, 60, 70,000 people the way, you know, a WrestleMania can be. It's, it's going to be a smaller scale than that. And I'll be really interested to see like how those shows fare because you're looking at, now you're, you're kind of looking at a bunch of big pay-per-views. And I think we've talked a ton about being skeptical about the depth of star power that WWE has at their disposal and how they can make each one of these shows feel like they're really important outside of just putting them in a stadium. Do any of the shows jump out to you as like a particular interest about what they're going to do? Um, I, I think just Clash of the Castle, uh, just more of it's a new environment for WWE in terms of just being in Wales. And like, I think the fact that show is going to sell out faster than these, uh, the first two shows, SummerSlam Money in the Bank kind of shows that like, it's just more of demand really you know like the like a big uk show hasn't really happened like this and like ever and so obviously the 30th anniversary of the SummerSlam at wembley stadium yep exactly they need to find 
they need to find the the British bulldog kid. You know about that? The bulldog's gonna <laughs> yeah, win whether exactly. he wants to or not. They yeah, need to find uh, them and, uh, and 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 find what they're up to uh, thirty years later. Well, you know, WWE's made record profits, and so like they ha- clearly have the money to hire <laughs> private investigators <laughs> to find this kid. I actually <laughs> think somebody. I think I actually think somebody did track them down, like someone who oh. does like shoot interviews or something like that. I haven't right. looked that up before, but I think someone did track down uh, that kid in <laughs> like an adult, like a forty-year-old uh, adult now. But um, yeah, I agree. I think that's the most interesting show. Like you said, look, they draw a lot better in Europe. Like I think they drew their largest house show of the year in Paris um, yep. last week. So they draw really well in Europe. There's obviously a pent up demand. I think with the Cardiff show, you're getting a lot of people, not just in Cardiff, but throughout the UK and throughout Europe who really want to attend a major WWE show. And there hasn't been one in 30 years. And you know, some of those people do fly um to wrestlemania each year the pandemic has made that difficult you know the last few years so there's pent-up demand there it's much easier to fly to into to cardiff or to fly into london and, and take a train or however people choose to get there uh if you're living in germany or france or eastern europe or spain or italy or you know you're really talking about this massive uh population center of europe that are going to be traveling to this show it's, it's going to be a really big deal i don't know if they'll they'll take it as a big deal like, I don't know if Vince is going to go all out and make it like a WrestleMania level show. I think they'll look at the, you know, they sold the tickets that they needed to sell. Um, I don't know if they're going to be giving away a bunch of big matches on the show or, or what. I guess the idea is that it's going to be Drew versus Roman. Um, be fascinated to see if Drew actually wins that match. Um, I would bet against it at this moment in time. But it, it is definitely going to be like, you know, SummerSlam, Money in the Bank, eh, no. I don't, yeah, I, don't. Uh, I, I definitely agree because like they 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 already did the Allegiant Stadium uh, gimmick already. Like they've already been to that venue, and you know the last show, the last you know um, last shows were fine, um, but they're nothing really to um, nothing to write home about at least. Yeah, I mean they drew really well at the Las Vegas show, you know SummerSlam last year at the Allegiant Stadium show, but they also had John Cena versus Roman Reigns, and it exactly. was like kind of their. There, I guess they did the Money in the Bank the year the, the, the month before, which was like their formal return to the big crowds, but they were still kind of, you know, Cena came back. And I don't know if Cena's going to be around this summer. You know, Roman Reigns is off these B shows that they're doing. He's not going to be on TV every week. Um, that's the latest report is that he's going to be working on a much lighter schedule. He might not, he's not going to be wrestling. It looks like at Hell in a Cell, which is their next pay-per-view in June. So you know, it's an interesting strategy to have these kind of big stadium shows, you know, more often. I think it kind of sends a message that the B pay-per-views are now like even more, you know, even less relevant. Like we're coming off the backlash show where the world title wasn't defended and they only had one title match and, you know, they sold 8,000 tickets to a show in Providence, Rhode Island. It doesn't seem like it's that, you know, it's very B showy, like, um, and, and, and I just, I'm very curious to know what they decide to do with, um SummerSlam and Money in the Bank you know Money in the Bank will have the Money in the Bank matches um which generally have interest when you don't really have to have anything special for them you just kind of throw the people out there in a ladder match but I'll interest to see you know who's going to be challenging Roman and who do they feel confident in doing that is it going to be Cody uh, that would be the most interesting one for them to do Randy Orton feels like he's really over at the moment he is in this tag team with Riddle um do you, do you i think you could do orton versus reigns without like breaking up the tag team or anything and that could be good um or at least interesting for wwe fans i don't know what do you think about like as far as like what they have to make these shows that are in stadiums that are supposed to feel special actually feel like they're special yeah there's certainly um not a lot going on especially if you look at the women's division i mean ronda rousey uh she's the champion right now but like obviously like she's nowhere near the draw she was back in when she was mm-hmm. in her UFC days and, and you know, or closer he, to the UFC days, like her first run. Exactly. And like, you know, the, the stadium shows aren't really selling. Um, she's on the posters for um, some of these shows. Yeah, I'm talking about the posters right now. Yeah, like, like Brock Lesnar, Bobby Lashley, you know, Charlotte, Bianca Belair, of course, you know, infamously last year, uh, Belair, you know, she got squashed by Becky Lynch um in uh SummerSlam and you know I'm, I'm assuming they're going to do something similar uh, not really something similar to that but they'll invoke that um in their next build up but even then like 
there's not really a lot of interest in that. Uh, they're uh, obviously they're trying to do something. Um, there are other Lacey Evans, you know, she um, is going to be the top heel, I guess, you know, because, you know, you want to boo a veteran, right? You want to boo a boo a single mother. I she guess. talked so. about overcoming depression. What a weakling. Boo her. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, they're baking on that. Alexa Bliss is coming is back as well. Um, but even then, it's like it's nothing really interesting. It's just more of old names we saw before who haven't really been treated as big stars just yet, especially Lacey Evans, who, you know, I, I think they see something in her, but like, I don't know what their actual plan is uh, for her. Yeah, with the women's, you know, I thought, you know, Ronda and Charlotte, I think did really well at Backlash. I think they had yeah, a very exciting did. match. I'm really interested in seeing what happens with Ronda wrestles, like another big star in the women's division, because the, you know, I think Charlotte, people would just have so much Charlotte fatigue that they're not going to cheer for Charlotte. But I think they are going to be in, it's going to be really interesting to see if they expect Ronda Rousey to be the baby face and she is wrestling, you know, Becky Lynch or Sasha Banks or Bailey comes back, um, which I think I haven't heard that much about Bailey, but I assume she's, she's probably going to be close to coming back. I know she missed WrestleMania, but um, I think she torched her ACL just about a year ago. So um, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, she should be back this summer, I guess. And obviously but I think like if Rhonda has to face those people, those people are going to get cheered over her. And um, what happens from there, I have no idea. Um, it definitely seems like with like the Bianca and Becky thing, they're definitely holding off on doing that match again for one of these big shows, right? Bianca's just kind of been, uh, you know, she had this feud with Sonya Deville and she's just kind of been, you know, kind of have these like, I don't want to say cooler feuds because she's she is the champion. So it's not like she's being put on ice, but it's kind of like they're trying to keep Becky and Bianca somewhat separate you know, for these smaller scale events, because they know that's one of their larger women's matches is to do that rematch from WrestleMania. Um, seems like a long time to wait for SummerSlam, uh, you know, to, to hold off on that match, but perhaps at, you know, Money in the Bank, they could do it. Perhaps Becky wins again, and then you can do a third match where Bianca's trying to regain the title. I don't think that's something that's out, outside of the realm of, of possibility. Yeah, I mean, kind of just looking at the SmackDown women's roster, I mean, there's not really a lot of big names outside of, like, the main people. Uh, obviously, you have Charlotte, but, like, Raquel Rodriguez is someone um, who got brought up from NXT, who, you know, they're, like, they're, she's just having a bunch of squash matches. Uh, she's ha doing the typical WWE babyface stuff. She's smiling a lot. She's like, oh, I'm so glad to be here, uh, kind of a de deal, um, which is, you know, typical WWE kind of thing. But, you know, the SmackDown, uh, the women's tag team champions, you know, like, I don't know, like, you have Shayna Baszler, but I don't, that's not really a big match, Ronda versus Shayna, as much as probably it could have been a couple of years ago, back when, like, the whole four horsemen thing was actually a big deal, which, you know, it's kind of lost its luster as of now, but I don't know if, like, hey, you know, they used to be MMA fighters, let's go to Vegas um, for have a big MMA-style match, like, I don't know if that's actually going to be their plan, but, I um, mean, who knows what, you know, how they're going to market um, these big stadium shows because like you said earlier you know these shows aren't really selling too well in the U.S. you know I think last I saw from the Nashville show I think they only sold like half their tickets um, as of like a couple weeks ago um, and since then it has really moved significantly. Yeah I think Nashville's at like 21,000 tickets sold which they're running a 75,000 seat stadium obviously they're not gonna set up for that many but like, like it's hard like the, it's the same thing with Wrestlemania where it's like okay, they drew what would be considered a very large crowd by basically most standards. You know, if they drew 55,000 yeah. people, you know, for two nights, that's great. But they're obviously not drawing as big as they can. And like, like you're going to run a football stadium, but you're going to draw 22,000 people or, or maybe you'll run, even if you draw like 30,000 people, it's kind of like, we're kind of used to WWE selling out those or coming close to selling out those kind of stadiums. So you're kind of doing like these half-filled large NFL stadiums just doesn't seem like kind of feels like it's kind of a failure even though if you look at it, it's like obviously it's better to sell 30,000 tickets than it is to sell 15,000 tickets like you would in an arena for a big show um so there's 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 that you know with WWE when it comes to like these matches I think like because WWE has very low standards for like what can constitute a pay-per-view match 
you can kind of do anything and get away with it in the sense that, yeah, you can get away with the match. Like we can bring loose Lacey Evans back and she can be a heel and she can wrestle Ronda Rousey. And that's something that you can do. Like you physically can do that match. You can have it happen, but it's not going to excite anyone. And I think that's what I'm looking for is like, what do you have to actually excite people? I think Randy Orton versus Roman Reigns is an exciting match for their fan base. I think when I was watching the match uh, backlash, the, the six-man tag match. I was like, Roman Reigns versus Randy Orton feels like the biggest match uh, the company has because Roman has been pushed at this level above everyone else. So he feels like this, this certain level of star. Randy Orton has not been pushed recently at that level, but he's Randy Orton. He has credibility with his fan base based on his many, many years of being pushed as a top star. So he is over in a way that someone like Drew McIntyre is not, or, or Bobby Lashley is not, or Riddle is not. Um, and so he feels like he's at a certain level as a, stu- as, a, as, a, as a star where I feel like that match is really big. Cody, you know, Cody versus Roman, it's a match you have to do. Uh, I'm really, I think they should do it sooner rather than later because I am, I don't know. I just feel like Cody's staying, Cody, Cody's longevity in, in WWE, I don't know when the honeymoon period is going to end. I don't know. You can argue that it's already starting to wilt. Um, but I don't know if he's going to be this kind of level star for, you know, a very long time, unless he's booked as a super duper strong star. Uh, And to do that, he needs to wrestle Roman and he needs to beat him. Um, I think that's like the only way to really kind of establish him as a true top guy in the company and not just like this upper mid card guy that you can throw in a match, which WWE has way too many of those guys and not enough top, top, top stars. Yeah, I think like Cody would be like the perfect guy. Like a Roman's gonna take his take his break for you know Hollywood or for whatever. You know, I think Cody's the perfect guy to you know hold the title, and then Roman can come back once he's back on a full schedule and beat him. Like you know, you, like, as long as you've established that Cody's you know a, a top star uh, during that time. But you know, I think Cody's the, the perfect guy to beat Roman. Um, but you know, I, I think going back to your earlier point on how like. You know, like selling 30,000 tickets is obviously a good d- deal, but like for WWE, they've already set their own, they set their own expectations. Like, you know, the reason why they've said they're the biggest company, why they're, you know, like, oh, AW is not comparable to us because we do, do we do do these stadium shows. Like we sell out these big football stadiums, you know, uh, allegedly sell out these football mm-hmm. stadiums. Um, and so these are expectations they set upon themselves, you know? And so if you can't meet your own expectations, that's kind of on you, you know, it's not something the fans or other people have brought on to WWE. This is their own expectations. These are their own things. They t- they talk about on their uh, earnings calls that, Hey, we do these big stadiums. WWE is a big product. You know, we do this number of social uh, hits and such there. So these are their own expectations. And if they can't hit them, that's kind of on them. You know, that's not really on anyone else because, um, you know, you you just haven't been able to build up uh, these big shows properly. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that goes into the big stadium show, like aspects of it. Like we know WrestleMania draws really well a lot because fans travel and they fly in from all over the country and they go to that, they, they do that. They've, you know, last few years, they've taken to running Royal Rumble in stadiums. And the same idea is that Rumble's this big event, people will fly in and it doesn't really matter where it is because people will fly in uh, from around the country or around the world to see it. And then, but when you start adding more and more, I mean, eventually there becomes a point of diminishing returns where your fan base can't fly eight times a year to go to WWE shows. Um, especially if they, you know, are starting to get burned out and maybe feel like there's like an inferior product being presented. I've heard that, you know, WrestleMania weekend, one of the reasons I feel like there was a down period for WrestleMania weekend this year um, is I heard is that a lot of the fans that are really into indie wrestling and wanted to go to a bunch of indie shows and, and would be into that, they're not interested in WrestleMania anymore. And so they didn't fly in for WrestleMania. So they weren't in town for that weekend. Um, the people who were in town were WWE fans who aren't going to necessarily go to, you know, Joey Janela's spring break or, you know, go to these various, you know, other shows that are put together by all these various independent groups. And so I think like you're talking about a, a smaller core base of fans and you're now expecting them to fly a lot um, this year. Some of those people you're also competing with, you know, some of those people that fly to WrestleMania also will fly to All Out or AEW shows or for they're going to Forbidden Door or um, Double or Nothing. So they're also adding that to their travel schedule. And AEW is increasing the competition when it comes to the traveling fans that you can recruit um, to go to these shows. So that fan base, I don't know. Like I was, 
you know, the SummerSlam, I was really skeptical. I'm really skeptical about, you know, what their expectations are for SummerSlam. Look, if they think 30,000 is considered a big win, then they're going to hit 30,000. So good for them. But if they were expecting 70,000 or 50,000, that's a big ask because we're talking, we're not talking about a major metro area. It's in Nashville, Tennessee. It's not at, you know, Met. MetLife Stadium in New York. It's not at, you know, the LA, you know, Coliseum. It's not at, you know, AT&T Stadium in Dallas. It's it's at like what I would consider like a mid-major market. Um, you know, a, a lovely place to, to visit, uh, but not necessarily like a, a major metro area. So I was really kind of curious to know what that big show potential is, you know, for the SummerSlam brand, which doesn't have any you know, doesn't have the match like the Royal Rumble does, and it doesn't necessarily have the WrestleMania's, you know, cachet with fans. But I just think it's it's really, I don't know, I would be really interested in knowing what their actual expectations were and also what they were telling, you know, the arena and what they were telling the the whoever, you know, when they were renting a stadium, like when they're and they're they're going in front of these local tours and boards or or different committees to kind of who are trying to, you know, oh, we want a big WWE event in our city. You know, I'd be interested in knowing if they're like, you know, going to, to Money in the Bank and they're saying, yeah, like, you know, we draw 70,000 people for WrestleMania. So 70,000 people are coming to Money in the Bank. And it, that's, you know, I'd be wondering if that's the kind of pitch they're making. And I kind of feel like it probably is, but I can't really prove that, obviously. Yeah, I mean, you would assume that's the pitch that they're making. And, you know, it's all it's going to be. You know, it's my um, SummerSlam is like only a few weeks after that, July 30th. And so that's a very big turnaround from one big show to another. Obviously, you have that cool down period, probably for travel reasons. Uh, like after July 30th, you know, September 3rd is the clash at, at the castle. And so, like, there's a decent cool off period there, but you're going to um, one big show and then, like, what, three weeks after or so to another big show, big stadium show. Um, obviously that's kind of typical for the WWE schedule, but still for these big stadium shows, that's really a really big expectation there um, that they have to fulfill. And, um, you know, I guess pending on the, the ticket sales and the reception of these shows that will probably, that will probably determine the future of whether they'll actually keep continuing um, on, on this path of be these big stadium shows in uh, during this time period. Yeah, let's just say I think this was kind of an experiment to see how much they could get from those that large group of traveling fans and if they how many shows they could get them to fly to each year. And, you know, I, I assume they're going to make money on these shows, otherwise they wouldn't be doing them. I'm assuming it's cost effective to do 30,000 fans in a football stadium versus 15,000 fans in a basketball arena. Right. I assume that they're making enough off of the attendance figures to justify probably the bigger cost. I wonder if they're getting some... Uh, you know, deals on stadiums because there's, you know, we're still coming from back from the pandemic and maybe certain events for the stadiums haven't been taking place, you know, concerts and things like that. So the stadiums are more available. We've seen that in Japan, right? In Japan, we see, you know, a lot more Tokyo Dome shows, a lot more Fukuoka uh, Dome shows, a lot more of these, you know, Bud uh, Budokan Hall shows, a lot more of these, uh, these, these bigger arena shows take place yeah. because, they're available and they're getting them, you know, these companies are, are getting them at a cheaper rate. I wonder if that's, you know, a factor. I wonder if, you know, governments are giving them tax incentives to come the way they would for the Super Bowl or WrestleMania because they want them to happen and in WWE's pitching that they're going to have all these people flying in. Um, so all of that is, I think, um, something to, I'd be watching to see, you know, what they do next year. If we're going to see more stadium shows, which I think is a possibility. Maybe every WWE pay-per-view is a stadium show. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, I think it's you know, it, it, it's you know, I think when you put it down as a stadium, you you sell more tickets. Like, I don't know if SummerSlam would be instantly sold out right now if they were running at like a fifteen thousand vent you know seat venue, even though they've sold twenty one thousand tickets or distributed twenty one thousand tickets. In an, obviously, you know, secondary market, it's going to buy more tickets if there's more available, but. Um, it's just, it's, I'd be fascinated to see kind of, this seems like to be the first step in what, it seems like a long-term strategy for um, WWE to kind of enhance its, it, its um, you know, making more money off of, of live gates and also kind of enhancing its image by being like, we don't just run, you know, we might, you know, our television viewership might be down from, 
you know, where it was, you know, in during the Attitude Era, but we weren't running as many stadium shows. And look, we've, we've got, we, you know, look how we've increased our, our output by we're, we're running 10 stadium shows a year when we used to only do one. And, and I think that might be part of it is to kind of show, you know, how strong a company is by running these stadium shows, even if they're not necessarily making that much more money off of them. Yeah, exactly. You know, like it's probably, I would, I wouldn't be surprised if Nikon had some, a very detailed plan of why they're doing this and what his goals are uh, for this. Um, again, we again, like you said, we don't know the numbers. We don't know what their metrics that they're looking for are. Um, but I think I wouldn't be surprised if Nikon, um, WWE president, uh, has some sort of um, long-term plan in mind uh, for what he wants uh, for um, these shows. Yeah, it definitely seems like it's driven by Nikon. I think. Uh... That's part of that's part of the plan is to kind of show to show off WWE's you know strength and try to get more WWE's you know really about getting more uh, money from its its group of mega fans. Yeah, and I think you see like the kind of they've been offering more like ex really expensive merchandise. You know things that cost five hundred dollars, things that cost five thousand dollars, like the the fiend belt that they were selling, and you know the special like you know Undertaker WWE Championship themed belts and um you know you got your cameos now and you got all these things that i think they're just trying to extract more money from a smaller you know core of fan base that is willing to spend a lot of money on wwe um and they're far from the only company that's attempting to do that it's a very viable strategy which is to say these people will spend a lot of money on our product let's try to see how much money they're going to spend on our product um i wanted to talk a little bit about all out um, so we've got All Out, which normally takes place in Chicago. It's every All Out, starting with the original All In, has taken place at the, it's not called the Sears Center anymore. It's called something else I can't remember. But um, the same building in, in Chicago, Illinois. Chicago is getting, um, they are getting Forbidden Door, which yeah. is happening at the United Center. And that's happening in late June. So you have All Out in September. Don't have an announcement yet that's taking place in Chicago. I'm very curious to know if it does take place in Chicago or if they go somewhere else. Um, I think I'm of, of the idea of sort of like a why not do Chicago again. It seems like their like business hasn't really um, there's not an over fatigue just yet of hitting Chicago too many times. Um, at least from what I've gathered, um, but obviously that that is always the fear, right? Like you could, there's over there's over fatigue of hitting one area too many times um, as a company. Um, but there's also other business opportunities as well. You know, like you said um, earlier, you know, the AEW is hitting the Inglewood area, and so like there's plenty of other uh, markets that AEW has not hit uh, just yet. And so is that an opportunity to do that for all outs? Um, it could possibly be. That's what I think. I don't think it's necessarily like they're gonna sell if they run all out at the, the Sears Center and it does like you know, it seats like you know, 10,500 fans, they're gonna sell that out instantly. No problem. I have absolutely zero concern that they're gonna hit that. That so fatigue in the Chicago market wouldn't be wouldn't be my concern. My concern would be we're doing this big show in Chicago, it's a big deal. Let's try to spread that out further and try to get into a new market, like you said got all out which is probably your most marketable event um you know aw does not have a wrestlemania equivalent where they can just kind of use it which is clearly their biggest event of the year i think i think all out and double or nothing are, are pretty close in, in in kind of their importance but none of them really stand out above that far above the way like wrestlemania would or like even like the royal rumble would but i would say i take all out and I've seen speculation on this, and I don't know if it's true, but it just seems like such a good idea. Like, why not run the Rogers Center in Toronto with All Out? That's your stadium show. First time AEW's ever done, like, a big stadium. You know, you have the Arthur Ashe, which is, you know, also a stadium show. But you could draw 40,000 fans. I don't know. Like, can you draw 40,000 fans? I this, that Toronto is one of those markets where I think a lot of people have pointed to and say, there's a lot of demand for this. They haven't had AEW yet. You haven't had um, like a, um, you haven't traveled to, to to AEW yet. You know WWE hasn't 
run a major event? Uh, did they have did WWE run like Survivor or SummerSlam or or Royal Rumble in Toronto recently? I can't remember. Um, I, it might have been Toronto. I don't know if it's specifically the Rogers Center. But, oh no, uh, no, they haven't run the Rogers Center since WrestleMania 18, I think. Yeah, but I uh, I, I, do, I do remember a, a Canada show somewhere. Um, I'm actually going to look that up right now, but because because they maybe they did, but you're looking at a, a wrestling starved market, especially for AEW. Uh, people point to the Canadian TV ratings where AEW does consistently better than than WWE does. I think part of that is they're on a better network, but uh, this is a uh, this is a um, major show in a major city where they haven't been to yet. Um, you could still, if you're from the United States, you'd still travel there. It's, you know, Toronto is not that far from, you know, you know, it's definitely, it's not that far from like major markets like Detroit. It's not that far from Cleveland. It's not that far from Pittsburgh or Buffalo, New York. It's not really that far from New York city or Philadelphia or Chicago either. It's, it's not an impossible place for American fans to travel to. Um, you have potential, like you have a lot of Canadian stars. You obviously have Chris Jericho. I don't know if Kenny Omega is coming back, but if he is and CM Punk's the champion by then, you can do CM Punk versus Kenny Omega at the, at the, the Sky Dome um, or the Rogers Center. I mean, even, even if you did the, um, uh, it's not called the Air Canada Center anymore, I don't think, but the, the whatever the, the basketball, the major basketball yeah. arena is in Toronto, you could even do that. I mean, and you could sell, you know, whatever, 18,000 or no, probably not that many, but like 14,000 tickets there and still be in a new market and be hot. But I think this is a real opportunity for them to do a legitimately big stadium show um, and have it go over really well. There's also, they haven't been to London before. They haven't been to England. They haven't been outside of of America. Um, Tony Khan has talked about that a lot. He obviously owns stadium in England, which would make it pretty cost-effective. To that degree, it's, you know, I I don't know how many people that could fit a Craven Cottage for a wrestling event maybe 25 or 30,000, but obviously, again, a stadium scale size show in a market that you have not been in that is probably starved for your product. And so I think about All Out, maybe doing it all, you know, you you come into problems with like pay-per-views because if the pay-per-views going to be in England, it's going to start, you know, during the middle of the day, which is not optimal for, you know, American viewers who are going to be the bulk of your pay-per-view buying audience. So maybe that six should be like, maybe not one of your major pay-per-views should be the the um the the england show but i think the toronto show to me it's a no-brainer i don't know why they haven't done it yet i I think they're really weird this is like turning into a long rant from me but like i think they're really weird with where they tour and they keep going back to these same spots and they have all of these major markets that they have not gone to yet and tony always says oh you know we're looking at doing this or we're planning on it or just wait and i know they finally got the los angeles show but like I just don't understand some of the the decisions that they make when it comes to just being in the same markets over and over and over again, when they have all these markets that they haven't explored yet. Yeah, I 100% agree. You're like, they're always hitting um, like New York or Florida. Like you've already done a bunch of like shows, like they're they're doing UBS arena again. They're doing- New York's um, fine. New York's New York. And New York and Chicago, like that's fine to me. These running in in Florida so much and in Texas so much and not like, you know, some of those shows have done quite well and, you know, the 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 HEB Center in Cedar Park, Texas, or whatever is you know like yeah. uh, the, the you know it's suddenly like the ECW <laughs> arena of 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 of, of AEW, <laughs> but they have like um you know they draw well there and they're you know they go to Houston a lot and it's like how why are you guys in these towns so much when you haven't been to you know you haven't been to San Francisco you haven't been to Seattle you haven't been to anywhere in Canada um you know these some of these major huge markets uh, I don't think they've been in Phoenix Arizona um no you know there's 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 some pretty large markets that they have not been into that they and they keep kind of running back and i haven't really gotten satisfactory explanation for why they haven't been you know touring as you know run why they're still running the same places over and over again yeah i mean you also um have the big thing as well that um bret hart like you could that, that you can have bret hart on your show in the toronto show um potentially because you know that's something tony khan has uh, been asked about like oh will bret hart ever appear on an AEW show like yeah you could have bret hart and the all out show just have a dual a small spot with uh, the um ftr like that will be a huge uh, draw if you know if you're in fear of not selling you know forty thousand tickets uh perhaps but yeah like 
you know, you have the Portland area uh, uh, as well. Like, I, I don't, I don't know. Like, they, they just maybe it's just a risk aversion, probably for AEW. Um, under but, you know, for whatever reason, there is um a high risk aversion to really just go to these um you know, quote unquote unknown markets uh for them. But yeah, like there it there is at least the fatigue for um these non-major areas like the sort of like your you know the 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 mid the midwest like uh, these random texas places like you said like yeah there's a lot of um repetition in terms of running these same venues which you know they do pretty well um but there is potential for growth um i, I think is what you're getting yeah there's potential to you know expand even farther and really um you know surpass your own records that you've already done so far like there's a lot of potential uh to be had yeah, um, so I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, it just seems kind of strange to me. And they look, they have this summer coming up. And, and when they see these, these, you know, we're going back to, you know, we're going back to, 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 to these, some of these venues. I'm like, look, I, I'm living it up. You know, they're coming to, they're coming to, uh, they're coming back to Boston for a fourth time. They're running the DCU Center in Worcester, which I think is a little interesting that they're going for a bigger venue further from the city after selling out the Aganis Arena a few times. Um, so I'm happy that they're coming back to Boston a few months after they're in Boston. And, and like, again, with certain markets like New York and Chicago, like I get it, like those are major markets they should be served the most, especially because you can draw really big. They drew a big again at the, you know, UBS arena, you know, they, they've drawn well in Newark, New Jersey, and, and obviously the, the, the Arthur Ashe show, a grand slam. It just seems weird to me that they're like, you know, they're, they're, they're running again in Rochester, New York. And it's like, okay, you've been to Rochester twice and you've never been to San Francisco. And, and I just feel like they have so much, uh, you know, the Seattle show to me, you have Brian Danielson and you have Darby Allen and you have these, these stars from Seattle. And I want AEW does such a good job with a lot of the talent's hometowns. I'm like, that's going to be a special show is that Seattle show. When is it happening? Um, and you're kind of like seeding that territory toward to, to WWE in some ways, if you don't, you know, take that as a priority. And I, I feel like, I'm a little, I don't know, like, it doesn't really impact me because ultimately I don't really care where the shows are, like, as a viewer that much. Yeah, of course. Like, you know, I, you know I'm getting served as a fan. I, you know, they come to my neck of the woods pretty frequently, uh, but I'd be interested. I just, I just think it's, it's kind of weird how they've, they've kind of been, you know, very rigid on kind of going back to the same spots, you know, over and over again. Um, is there any other AEW shows that we haven't gotten to yet i think we're done for their summer at least yeah that's pretty much it you know obviously you know they'll have um grand slam but like 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 we said earlier you know there's no confirmation of when that's going to be um could be just in september like uh, around like kind of what it was last uh last year um but other than that uh, there's nothing real much um for aw's calendar that's been announced at least yeah, and then so that's, I think that's it for America. We've kind of hit all the major shows. I know we've got the, the the Clash of the Castle that WWE has. We kind of talked about as their probably really big show. Be interesting to see. I mean, they have, it's really interesting is that they, WWE for like England is their mark, is the biggest market in the UK. Obviously most, you know, most of the people in the UK live in England. And yet, they never really have, they still are looking for like that big British star or big English star, I should say, you know, they have, when they, they try really hard to push, you know, with Seamus, who's Irish, Becky Lynch is Irish, uh, Drew McIntyre is Scottish. I mean, those big events happening in Wales, but they definitely don't have that British bulldog figure um, that they had in 1992. And I don't, I'm trying to think, do they have anyone from Wales on the main roster? Um, I'm sure they have someone in NXT UK, but... Uh, that's why I tried to uh, look look up, but I could not find uh, anyone that is from Wales, which is which is why I thought it was funny. Like they're doing a show in Wales, but I guess you know they have the, they have the big uh, venue over there, so that's probably why they're doing it. Yeah, sure like I'm assuming I'm assuming it was better, made more sense. Fine, look, they're going to sell out. They're selling out anyway, so it doesn't yeah. matter. I assume that you know the stadium in Cardiff is cheaper than Wembley. You know, maybe you could charge more at Wembley. So, yeah, I, I, but, but obviously, I think that's like a cheaper thing. Maybe the Cardiff Board of Tourism or whatever they have over there gave them a deal. We've seen this before. It's when they ran the stadium show in Australia. 
the Australian commission kind of like paid for the show almost in a way. So it made no sense. WWE kind of risk-free went over there and ran a stadium show in Australia, which drew really well, by the way, and something that I think should be attempted again and should also be a market that AEW is looking to tap into. Um, I think that that is all, you know, part of this should be parts of, of both companies' global plans. Um, you know, WWE, I mean, drawing that big house show in Paris, I'm like draw, do a, run a stadium in Paris if you want. Like, I, I think it makes most, more sense to run the stadium shows there than it does, um, you know, in America where you're not, you're maybe the, some of the, the, the markets have been exhausted and you're, you're kind of relying on the same fans from America to travel to all these shows. I do wonder if that's something that we see coming up, you know, maybe next year with WWE, maybe next year over their summer, we start seeing stadium shows in Paris. I'm sure there's no shortage in stadiums of every size in Paris. I don't know if they'll run like the, Parc de Paris, like the big one that they have there, but they're, I'm sure they have smaller sized stadiums in Paris or Berlin or, or Munich or Barcelona or Madrid or Rome or any of these, you know, big European markets. Those seem like they're untapped if you're a wrestling company and you can think you can get fans to travel from the continent of Europe to go to those shows. Yeah, for sure. Especially with like, you know, you have, um, I guess, Gunter is he's known as, but Walter, you know, like, like he, be, he's going to be pretty big in the, the Berlin, uh, Ger Germany market. And so definitely that's a big opportunity there uh, for them. And, you know, uh, I guess maybe that's just more research on their end of like whether like um, where, where exactly to go uh, for, for those kind of shows. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm sure that, that's something on their mind, at least uh, in terms of going after um, somewhere other than the UK in terms of a big stadium show in Europe. Yeah, no, it's definitely, it's like I said, if you're AEW, I think, what are you waiting for? Um, yeah, exactly. You no, know, maybe like, I, I, especially with the England and, and um, Canada shows, obviously the pandemic made it harder to, to plan, but I would want to get that on the books as soon as possible. Um, I did look it up. WWE did run SummerSlam in 2019 at uh, in Toronto. They ran it at the Scotia Bank Arena, which oh, okay, yeah. the, the new name of the the Air Canada Center. I, every building and every arena will always be like whatever it was called in like 2005, 2006 to me, because that's when I like learned them all, like as a, as a sports fan. Yeah. So I will never be able to keep up with the constant changes so that building in toronto will always be the air canada center to me like i'm sure it's probably maple leaf gardens to older fans yeah exactly same here you know like this the state it'll always be the staple center not uh, crypto.com arena <laughs> yeah that's a tough one that's a tough one because crypto is like easy to make fun of so like it just feels like we're losing a, something in society that it's not called after an office of like this arena is not <laughs> yeah. called after an office supply <laughs> store <laughs> Um, it's, it's that building should be named after an office supply store, not this, you know, cryptocurrency. Like, <laughs> exactly. Um, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's kind of funny how that works. Um, but that's all I have today. And do you have anything else we haven't gotten to? Uh, no, that's it for me as well. All right. Well, awesome. Um, we appreciate everyone who's been tuning in. Uh, we th I thought this episode came together pretty well and extract in really excited for a, a full wrestling summer, um, starting, you know, you know, Sunday with the best of super junior starting off. And then it's just going to yep. be going, going, going. So it's a very exciting time to be a wrestling fan, uh, no matter what company you support. Um, so uh, thanks to everyone for listening and we'll see you all next time.